Well, I didn't know whether I was going to be here or not, <laughs> and you probably wish I hadn't. <laughs> I'm too, I'm too croaky. Um, I, I just, this is a, a little bit of a, a preview. We're gonna, I'm gonna have to sit down. Uh, we're gonna sing a response to the Word of God at the end. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether you know this or not, but I know it well enough if I've got a voice when it's over that I can help you lead in this. One of the, when I used to uh, go to John MacArthur's church uh, in Southern California in the late 70s, um, we would always end the service pray, uh, singing that. He, he would not even pr- pronounce a benediction. He would pray and then we'd stand and sing, uh, He is Lord. So... Um, I have always thought since we shifted things around um, and didn't have a song before the Lord's Supper, uh, I thought it awkward. Now, here's the... I get no money for this, as you know, but this is a tool to help you grow. When I was a, a missionary in the tribal groups in southern Mexico, and I would more often than not hike into... Um, the tribal areas, sometimes I'd take a Mission Aviation Fellowship uh, aircraft or even a bus. Um, I had a little pocket-sized daily light. And it is the most, it was, and if I still have it somewhere, uh, I'm going to tear up uh, all of Baldwin until I find it. (laughs) But it it was pocket-sized, about the size of a Gideon's New Testament and when I would lie down on the cement or in the hammocks at night in the Indian villages, um, I would take that out and read it, and it was so encouraging. It's nothing, it is no commentary, it is nobody writing their idea of what the Scripture should say or does say, but um, it... Uh, <clears throat> uh, is a fantastic little... Uh, combination of um, scriptural thoughts, scriptural passages uh, spun together um, to whoops, sorry, um, to uh, be um, thematic. And I'll give you an example. This was uh, the morning edition the other day. Notice that there is nothing here but scripture. And then it doesn't even have the scriptural address until the bottom. But if you read this, it's it's so incredibly edifying. It takes a minute and a half. Uh, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as as one day, etc. And it's so, so encouraging. Um, And it's so simple. I know that many of you use the Paul Tripp. Um, devotional, and that is fantastic. I'm not uh, suggesting that you replace that with this, but um, uh, sometimes it's just nice to have something super simple. So um, that's my advertisement for the day, or advertisement, whatever. Um, <clears throat> we are coming to the Word of God, uh, as I mentioned earlier, on page 973. Um, It's Galatians chapter 2, and I'm going to read a little bit larger context for a reason, because um, this is how uh, Paul, the apostle, as led by the Holy Spirit, went from defending his apostleship to uh, writing a critical piece to people who were starting to mess around with the gospel by doing, by observing, by trying to perform, by jumping through hoops. I don't know if, you know, uh, circuses have transformed recently, but now they have a lot of dogs jumping through hoops of fire. Um, so the elephants have kind of been nixed as well as the, uh, the people sticking their head in the mouths of lions, which is probably a good idea. But um, they have poodles jumping through um, hoops of fire. And um, I have no idea why I brought that up. Now, that shows you how, how uh, in the fog I am. But anyway, 
um, people try to perform and they forget that's not how they came to Christ. That's not how we came to Christ. We didn't come to Christ by performing like a circus poodle. That's, a, that's why. Um, we have to remember that it's all about Christ from A to Z. Why do you think the Lord said, I am Alpha and Omega? Everything about me is from A to Z. Apart from me, you can do nothing. From A to Z. The Christian life is Christ from A to Z. We don't come to Christ and then start our little performances. But unfortunately, there was an apostle who cut back into dues. I'm going to read verse 11, which is at the top of page 973 in most... of the Pew Bibles. But when Cephas came to Antioch, that Cephas is the um, uh, other name for Peter. It means the exact same thing, little rock. Peter was not the rock on which our Lord built the church. Our Lord built the church on Himself. But when Cephas, little rock, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For, being, for before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas, the son of encouragement, is what that name means, he was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, again, Peter, um, <clears throat> before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are, <clears throat> are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, probably quoting back to Peter what he himself had used as an excuse to Paul. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through the faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Okay, so Peter wasn't trying to be justified by the works of the law. But he was still screwing up because he was behaving out of step with the gospel. So let's go on. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, aha, so it's not just Gentiles who are sinners, it's also Jews. Is Christ then a servant of sin? That sounds weird, but we'll cover it. Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. By the way, that verse 20 is one of those mega verses. You've got to know. You've got to know. And you've got to be clear in your mind that the Scriptures were not written in verse form. You know that, right? Verse form and chapter form did not come until the 1200, rather the 12th century, the 1100s, they were put in there by a guy. Is it a good idea? Was it a good idea? Well, yeah, it's good for us to say, oh, you know, I've memorized Galatians 2.20. That's good for us. But the problem, there there is a problem for everything that a human touches, even if it's good, even my summary of scriptures, even my sermons, I leave out stuff. Sometimes I don't even know it. 
So there's always clarity, but sometimes in that clarity comes obscurity because we forget things. We leave things out. We don't realize there are reflections or implications that we never thought of. But this verse, what we call verse 20, if you're going to memorize anything beyond looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is now set down on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. I think I just obscured that a little. But if you're going to memorize anything beyond Hebrews 12 too, this is one of those mega verses. <clears throat> I am crucified with Christ. And that issue is so huge, along with verse 19, that I died to the law, that I can't cover that today. I can, at best, tip my hat. Well, what's going on here? The, the larger context, and why do I have a flower here? The larger context of this letter is that the Galatian churches are being, are, are being warned by Paul in this letter that adding anything to the gospel of grace is to lose the gospel. Grace is 100% the activity of our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. The minute, the minute that you add a pinch of your own effort, Grace is gone. And the reason I put this flower up here is because in Central and South America, there's this flower, and it's called the Mimosa Puduca in Central and South America. And if you touch those fern pieces, if anything touches those fern-like leaves below the blossom, they curl up and they disappear. I think we have other plants like that here in the North America, but I couldn't find it online. But is that, that, that may not be a perfect illustration, but essentially, you touch it, you ruin it. There, <laughs> in our household, and I will not use names in this case, <laughs> um, one of our beloved members wanted to tweak a recipe. <laughs> it was great. I didn't get to hear this. I wish I had. But we've, we've repeated it over and over and over ever since. Um, but so there was a suggestion that a recipe be tweaked. And another individual to whom I'm akin only by marriage said, <laughs> why can't we just leave well enough alone? <laughs> <laughs> and her, her concern about the recipe being messed up. <laughs> and it, it was just a cry of desperation. It was like, you prick me, I'm going to cry out. Leave it alone! Well, that, another, that also is very similar to the Gospel. Only the Spirit of God cries out. Leave it alone. You're going to mess it up. I remember one time when I messed up a great bowl of oatmeal. I just kept pouring in the salt and pouring in the salt and pouring in the salt, having forgotten that I had already salted the water. I threw it out. I messed up the oatmeal. Don't mess up the Gospel by thinking I can add something to it. That's Galatians. That, that's Galatians. I mean, if you really want to bear down on what Galatians is about, that's it. The in, immediate context, however, is this. Peter and other uh, b believing Jews, some perhaps not real believing Jews, changed their behavior towards Gentiles because rock star teachers showed up. Guys, um, that's a problem in the church. And we in the PCA have a super problem with rock star pastors and theologians. 
um, Harry, the late Harry Reader ha made a, a really good observation. As small as our denomination is, 390,000, we box above our weight class. We have some incredible, incredible theologians and teachers that have real influence in the church far beyond the 390,000. Way beyond. And I could start naming names, but that would be the very opposite of what I want to do. There is a tendency for some of our rock star pastors in the PCA to have a, an aloofness about them. Or it may not just be the PCA. Maybe, maybe it's in other Bible-believing denominations. I have a real problem with that. A real problem. Because if I'm not mistaken, rock star pastors and theologians had to come to Christ by the same amount of shed blood of Jesus Christ that I had to be cleansed by. And they have the same flesh that I have that they war against constantly. Constantly. They have to take up the cross before they brush their teeth or before they have their first cup of coffee every day. I remember I, I had several rock star uh, professors in seminary, and if I named their names, you would, uh, for the most part, you'd recognize them. And there was this one, and he was respected worldwide. And one time, a friend of mine was, got into church heading toward Sunday school late, and clearly this rock star theologian was frustrated, and he had a bunch of kids. And he came into that church building yelling at his kids, really short. And ever since my friend told me that, I said, I ain't reading nothing that guy writes. Well, Donnie and I have discussed something about Alistair Begg and how he screwed up. And how... We're not throwing Alistair Begg under the bus. And I had no right to throw this rock star past. By the way, the, if there's one thing about this guy is he doesn't want to be a rock star. He's very humble. But I just thought, yelling at your kids, oh gosh, how inconsistent with the gospel. With the gospel is yelling at your kids. I suspect we've all done it, and I want to be compassionate about it and not throw you under the bus either if you have done that or have a tendency to lose your patience. But Peter and Barnabas and some great believers in Antioch, they screwed up and they misbehaved and they humiliated the Gentile believers. Why? Why did they do it? Well, verse 12 of, the, of this uh, context says, Before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself. What was the motive? Fear. Have you ever known a believer that you loved or respected and that you behaved one way when they weren't around, but then when they showed up, you changed your behavior. Now, on the one hand, if, if you, for example, if the individual is a vegetarian um, and you're going to go out to dinner with them, out of respect for them, maybe you didn't order a Brazilian barbecue. Do you know what that is? That's every sort of broiled and barbecued meat you could ever imagine, and it's good. You wouldn't want to do that in order to humiliate them. Or to, let's face it, they're going to covet, you know. I mean, <laughs> you, you, they've got a wilty leaf there of lettuce, and you're eating pork. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's, you know, pork on the barbie. That, that, that's good stuff. Um, but 
You wouldn't want to do that to them, would you? So that's, that's not the same thing. You would want to. Cheryl will do that. She will do it <laughs> because she ain't backing down <laughs> for, for no vegan. <laughs> but anyway, oh, I, I get it. I get it. But um, anyway, uh, that's not the same. This, what is one thing is, is that, for example, um, if you believe that the Word of God gives you the liberty to drink wine, uh, and we serve wine in communion, if we have a rock star theologian who would suddenly uh, sit down and, and come to us, we would be weak if we served Welch's grape juice one day for the Lord's Supper because we're too weak to hold our ground, which we believe is biblical. Now, on the other hand, we could get mean about this thing, and if people who really have a conviction about it in our congregation, if we don't provide them with a non-alcoholic um, juice or whatever, if, they, if that really is an issue that they stumble over, then we should. But we just don't change everything because we're afraid of somebody. As a matter of fact, Paul himself warned of this in Galatians 1.10, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I seeking to please men? See, there, there's two different issues here. The approval of men or pleasing men aren't necessarily the same. If I'm fearful of somebody or trying to get their approval, that could, that could go in two different directions. But they, can, they cause hypocrisy. And we know that Paul used that very word in verse 13. The rest of the Jews acted hypocritically and they led Barnabas astray by their hypocrisy. You know what hypocrisy is. It comes from the Greek meaning two faces because in, in, in Greek theater, people played more than one part in the theater and they would have masks that they would put on. In one case, the mask might be of some smiley face. But then they would turn around and play another character by removing the smiley face and putting on a tearful face or a groaning or a, or a sad face. That is the definition of hypocrisy. Two-faced. And Paul said that Peter, Barnabas, you precious saints, that are from a Jewish background here in Antioch, you're two-faced. And it's a tremendous warning. Paul calls them to task. Their conduct was not in step with the truth of the Gospel. And he rebuked them in front of everyone according to 1 Timothy 5.20. Why did he do that in front of everyone? Because you rebuke elders persisting in sin in the presence of all, so that all the rest may stand in fear. Not in fear of men, but in fear of our Lord. You rebuke elders who have already been approached privately and have refused to repent, you rebuke them publicly. And that, you know, that's a fearful thing for me. I'm, I'm a hardhead. And it could be that Steve, Steve and Jeremy sometime call me to task and I refuse to, to listen to them. But it's their duty. I mean, if I continue to persist, they are going to rebuke me. I know them. I know they will. They'll rebuke me in front of you. And I don't like that. I'm, I'm pretty proud. That hurts. 
This is uh, the passage that I really wanted to focus on. Our time is slipping away, and I'm frustrated with that because it's not the time, it's me. Um, but I want to <coughs> draw out certain points. Notice this, <coughs> that conduct is not in step with the gospel. But it also was theological. There was a theological issue here that they didn't realize. And I I said to Cephas, Paul said, uh, if you, though a Jew, lived like a Gentile and not like a Jew, that's good. Let's give a check mark there for Peter. That's great. You realize the gospel transcends Judaism. You didn't live like a Jew, but suddenly you're afraid. And now by what you've done, you are forcing the Gentiles to live like Jews. What does that mean? It's simply this. I mean, all Paul, all Peter was doing was You're unclean. I cannot eat with ceremonially unclean people. So we have to stop. Though we ate before, we're not going to eat together now. Do you realize what that would do to a Gentile person who is a new believer in Christ? It would destroy them. Just destroy them. And Paul even says, okay, all right, all right, Gentiles, uh, they're. Gentile sinners, I, 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 don't, I don't disagree. You say we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners? Okay, okay. But, and we've already covered this maybe ad infinitum or ad nauseum perhaps, uh, I have to be, even though I'm a Jew, we, we, have to believe in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith. If I'm going to come and stand declared righteous before a holy God, I have to come in the same manner in which a Gentile Gentile sinner comes, by faith in Christ alone. And not by works, not by works. No one is justified by works. And then he gets into this passage. If in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners. Ah, ha, ha. So, the sinners here are not just Gentiles, They're Jews. In other words, we're all on the same track. We're the same. Is Christ then a servant of sin? Now that is tricky. Because that's a very Jewish way of thinking. It's it's difficult. The whole rebuke of Paul to Peter and others was that they were living in contradiction to the gospel. They refused to eat with the Gentiles. And by extension, they weren't going to be able to celebrate the Lord's Supper with Gentile Christians. But that was not the biggest issue. Can you imagine if I were to come and say to Donnie, Donnie, because you like a little uh, tobacco between your teeth and gums from time to time, I'm not going to serve you communion. Wow. What a hypocrite. Not Donnie, Phil. Terrible. Terrible. He's a tobacco user. He ain't coming to the Lord's Supper. Nope. Can't do it. Donnie, you know I'm joking. I would never do anything like that. Oh, I'm... <laughs> but that's not the biggest problem, Donnie chewing tobacco. It's not the... No. Uh, not, come, not having the Lord's Supper with Gentiles is not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is, is that they were adding things to Christian living. They were adding things. What, what about that flower again? That mimosa 
Barbarossa, whatever. I don't even remember the name of it anymore. You touch it, you screw it up. It wilts. You touch it, it's gone. You add even a grain of salt of human effort to justification, all grace is removed. It's no longer grace, but you owe it to me. They are keeping the law to be holy. Peter was trying to keep the law by being holy, but the ceremonial law. That implies that the Jewish, uh, the Gentile believers had to start doing the same. So the freedom of the gospel was lost. And the gospel is lost because we are back to keeping the law again. That's why Paul rebuked them publicly. The danger is living out of sync with the gospel. And I want to rush to the end real quickly and say this, that we have a problem. And that's the tendency to add things to the gospel. Our broken natures have a tendency in them to want to help Jesus along. And that is not good. We are, we're, by doing so, we're taking our hands off the plow and looking back to our doing it our own way to come to God. And you may think, I don't have that tendency. Yes, you do. The worst lie is a self-lie. And we are all, and I mean all, we are super good at lying to ourselves. We are super good as husbands lying to ourselves when our wives call us to task. And wives are super good about lying to themselves and justifying themselves when their husbands call them to task, even if they're right on the occasion when a husband is right. About, I don't know, you know, a clock is right to, uh, twice a day, isn't that right? <laughs> Now, you do the math. Um, that's not much, but listen to what John Owen said. If a castle or fort is very strong and well fortified, yet there is a traitor on the inside who is ready to betray at the first opportunity, that fort is not secure from the enemy. We have a traitor in our very heart who is ready to unite us against us. Guys, you and I have an indwelling traitor. And he is you. And she is you. Peter was an apostle for crying out loud. You think, I won't do that. I'll never do that. I'll never cut back and start adding things to the gospel. Oh, really? You know who you sound like if you say that? Peter, before you denied Jesus Christ three times. You can and you will. And when you recognize it, you'd better stop it. Because somebody's going to pick up on it and they're going to misunderstand the Gospel. Interestingly, not only was Peter an apostle, but nine years before, he had a vision about eating and sharing the Gospel with Gentiles. Nine years before. And because of the fear and the need for approval of men, he went back on what he knew was wrong. So where does that leave us? Be on your guard. Against whom? Yourself. And anything you ever hear in this pulpit, or any other pulpit, I have been crucified with Christ. 
Does that sound like Paul trusted himself? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, or that can also be translated by the faithfulness of the Son of God. And that means a lot. I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God, not myself. Not myself. No trust in the flesh who loved me and gave Himself for me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come now to Your table and we pray that You will bless us and You will keep us, Lord Jesus. You will give us the grace to be on guard against ourselves that we'll realize that the the enemy is not just the evil one. But even though sin no longer reigns, in our mortal bodies, it's still there. And Paul didn't say, I'm dead with Christ. He said, I'm crucified. And we know that a crucified criminal on the cross can still talk and can still breathe and can still scream I pray, O Father, that You would enable us to ignore the screaming criminal within. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.